All right. The truth is, the circumstance, you know, in this yeshiva, at this stage of the game, we, we all have to reflect that this is not a place where, you know, you go to school. Go to school. What do you do in school? You play. You 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 finagle. You know what finagle means? You play a cop. You play a, and it may be between the uh, the tricks you learn something. And this goes on and on and on because you have infinite amount of time. Every high school kid will tell you time is endless. But here, each one has to reflect. I mentioned it a little while ago, two weeks ago, I think. Everything has to be accounted for. What did I learn today? What stride did I make? How did I break through, come closer to my goal? To becoming, so to speak, uh, conscious of who I am and what my life is about. It, it is that, that pressure full. You know how long a soldier trains to become a soldier and sent away to the front lines? Anybody know? Regular. Six months. Six months. From a kid in the street, and he gets trained and he's able to go and face the enemy. 24 hours. Excuse me? You have to work 24 hours for six months. We, is, we also put 24 hours 24 over here. Hours. He is also 24 hours. He is also 24 hours. And we have to know that he is also, we have to go through this period, Baruch Hashem, there is a different kind of training and for different purposes, and be able to face, face life. That's what we're here for. We're not here to prove what we can do, we're here to do. To accomplish and stand up on our feet and get and get the clarity, clarity of of our lives and and and, uh, and the path. All right, so let's go. <clears throat> As usual, in this Tuesday, we we speak on basis of a sikh from Reb. And um, we actually, so to speak, just uh, extract from the sikha certain points. We don't say the whole sikha with all the richness and all that. We extract certain points, and they, so to speak, the the heroa, the point of the sikha, and ultimately, uh, our goal is to find ourselves in that sikha. That is the the, the, the point. This parsha is parsha's chukas, as you all know. Chukas, the word chuko and chukas, is a fundamental, is a basic term in Yiddishkeit. You all know what does chuko mean? Huh? That's right. A statute, a decree. Yeah, however you translate it. it. And literally it means something that's engraved. There are many ramifications from the word chukah. It's called engraved. When something is engraved, it cannot vary. It is set in stone. So that has the word, the word the chukah. Chukah also implies this is a godly chukah, which means that this is something which God has established as, a, as a, his law. And it clearly represents a lawgiver, not something that we judge 
with our intelligence. We agree or disagree? Agree. We, 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 we have judgment, gift, you know, try to, to, um, 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 uh, so to speak, to, to acclimate to it. There's no acclimate, acclimation. If it's a hookah, it is already set in stone. This is already, it's already decreed. That's the principle of a hookah. In Torah, we all know that, generally speaking, there are three categories of laws. It's called Eidos, Chukim, and Mishpotim. You all know that. Eidos are ten testimonial mitzvahs, mitzvahs that, that uh, remind us and they represent certain uh, special events that occurred in our history, such as Pesach, coming out of Mitzrayim, Shavuos, getting Matan Torah, and all on and so forth. Purim, for instance, is also one of, is like a Eidos. Hanukkah. Even film goes into the category of an, of an Ois, of a sign that we are Hashem's chosen people. There are different, different qualities, Eidos. Then there's Mishpatim, <coughs> which are civil laws. Generally speaking, Eidos and Mishpotim are of the category that the human mind can relate to, can understand. It does not mean that we can, with our mind, understand every less detail, every less aspect the ruling that applies to that mitzvah. By no means does it fit our mind. But in general speaking, we can relate to that, to that general um, part of the other laws. For example, you're not allowed to steal. If you steal, you have to pay double. What's the logic of that? And if you, if you shecht, if you uh, stole a sheep and you shecht it, you, you pay four times as much. What's the logic of that? I mean, is that something that the human mind will say, okay, oh, four times, that's perfectly, that's, that's, that fits right away. It, it doesn't work like that. This Hashem said it's four. Hashem said it's two. And I mentioned one time here, discussed a very a paradoxical element in this, that in our judgment, who had, who had violated more so to speak, the human establishment, a, a, a thief or a robber? In secular society, a robber. In the, Hashem, in the Torah society, a, a, a sneak thief. God. Okay, so you're picking out the answer from your back pocket. Okay, but does it make sense? Yes. In, in a certain way. The, the thief doesn't fear God, he fears man. The robber fears neither man nor God. <sighs> On the other hand, the robber could cause violence. So maybe that's not quite as understandable. Who violated your rights? The one who stole from you, one who robbed you? I would imagine both. Who violated your rights more? The one robber. who robbed you or the one who stole from you? The robber. Okay. Who do you get more angry at? The, 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 thief, the thief or the robber? I'm a little weird. Possibly the sneak thief. I'm you you sneak more, sneak. yeah, okay. As long as no harm is done. Okay. Somebody approaches you with a gun and says, empty out your pockets, okay? And you are standing there and trembling, and you can't even find your wallet because of, because of, of, of fear. Who yeah. violated your, your, your well-being? That would be a robber. Thank you. Okay, robber. let's use our intelligence, okay? Robber is in public ceilings and um? Robber is in public ceilings and private? Robber is frontally. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be public. Frontally, he approaches you straight out, breaks through your door, and, and goes in there. He confronts you. What? Uh, forgive me, I was thinking on the street. The violation of the home is a big thing. There's no difference any place. A gazelle is a gazelle. He comes over, he, he grabs him right over, you, you 
A gazel, you have no doubt as to who gazeled you. A thief, you don't even know who, who, who stole from you. Okay, you feel violated, but your life wasn't threatened. <laughs> With the rubber, you, you, you thank God they came out alive. It's a little more scary. More scary. I agree with you in the sense. You, know, you don't know who did it. It can be more scary. You know, in a way. Yeah. And I was also thinking in, in terms of possibly uh, some snatching your wallet. That's technically, by the legal terminology, robbery. Yeah. Even if it wasn't done. That's case, right. That's right. Rendered. So you violated you straight out. They look. Yeah. You, who are you? Like, give me your wallet. So, but the Torah says that the robber, the robber suffers more consequences. I mean, that the, the thief suffers more consequences than the robber. That's the Torah. We discussed it, I think, over here one time, if I remember correctly. You remember? We, we spoke about it. The point of everything that we speak about and we discuss is that we should not, not know the answer, but we should try to understand the, the Torah logic, the Torah intelligence, how Torah looks at things, so that our own mind will open up. And if, we don't, if it doesn't make sense to us, we say so, it doesn't make sense. So on what basis does it make sense? That way it opens up, you go straight, you know, deeper into our soul. That's the whole point of this. Not just to know the answer. Uh, you know. Two times two equals to four. When you study in school, two times two equals to four, is it meant for you to know two times two equals to four? But is it, or is it meant for you to then project that three times three equals to nine. Hello? We should learn that three times three equals nine. We should understand how much. We should, we should be able to project it to all kinds of different multiplications, right? Not just two times three equals to four. So it's not a question of knowing the answer. It's a question of understanding what this is based on. What the concept behind it. What the insight is. Do you understand that? All right. So, as I said, they said, Eidos and Mishpotim are the two categories that lend themselves to human understanding. I said, by far, we're not going to judge the Torah on the basis of our understanding, but we can relate to what the Torah is teaching us. We can make sense of it, we can relate to it to some degree. Then we have questions, say, oh, this is that part which we don't understand. And then there is a chukim. Chukim is a whole category of mitzvahs that we have absolutely no, no way to make sense of. The classical of the, of the, of the chukim, the one that's so the most extreme, is poraduma. It's in today's parsha. In today's parsha. The Pora Duma is a hukah of that caliber, as it says, that Shloyme HaMelech, who was the wisest of all men, as the Torah says, Shloyme HaMelech, with his wisdom, was able to comprehend and get to the bottom of all mitzvahs, including the Chukim. But one, the Pora Duma. Pora Duma, Shona Amalek said, that, that stumped me. This is where I couldn't go, I couldn't go into it, I couldn't understand it. Omarte Echkem Obi Yerichekem Imeni, that's a posik in, in, in Kehelis. I said, Echkem I will be wise, Yerichekem Imeni, but it's really, I found out that it's distant from me. I really don't, don't understand Hashem's wisdom. Interesting thing. So therefore, this Pasha is called Chukas, because this Pasha gives us, refers to the Chuka of Pora Adum. But if you look in the Pasha, if you remember, it says, Zois Chukas Ha Toiro. The Chuka of the Toiro, it doesn't say Chukas Ha Poro. 
properly should say Chukas Apolo, the decree in the law of the Poro. The Poro is what is defined as a Chuk. And but the words in the Torah is it says Chukas Ha Toiro. And the Rebbe explains that the implication of this Zeitz Chukas Ha Toiro is that even though there are three categories, as we said, Eidus Chukim and Mishpatim, ultimately we have to understand that the entire Torah, all mitzvahs, are really Chukim. Even those mitzvahs that we tend to be able to relate and to understand, but in fact, they're all Chukim. They're all godly decrees. Not only are we not fully capable to fully understand them, but we follow them, we fulfill them, we, are, we observe them on the basis of them being godly commands rather than on the basis of them being uh, human um, uh, values. But we can relate to and understand. That's Chukas That's what it says. And this is why it says over here, Pora Aduma is the symbol of Torah. Symbol means it symbolizes the entire Torah. Pora Aduma is clearly a chukah. We can't even begin to, to make sense of it. And it symbolizes the entire Torah. The entire Torah really is a chukah. And really we, we, we follow through in the Torah as a chukah rather than as a as a, as a logical, um, as an intellectual thing that we can relate. Actually, we know, which we discussed many times in the proper, in the proper moment and proper time, that when Eden received the Torah from Hashem, Hashem's time, so in order to receive, to be able to want and to merit to be given the Torah, they said, Nase Nishma. And we discussed this many times in quite extensive way. Nase Nishma meant that he recognized the union of Torah, the principle of Torah, Nasu Nishma, by the way, means we will do and then we will understand. Which means we will not do on the basis of our understanding. We will do on the basis of the godly command or the godly presence. And then we will try to understand. And this is what merited, this is how Eden merited to get the, get the Torah. So the, the principle of Chukah, the principle of of, of the godly command and accepting the godly command goes all the way back to the very beginning when Taylor was first given. It was, that was the basis why Taylor, how Taylor was able to be given to us. So that is clear, it's all fine and good, but we need to focus in and to reflect what is so imperative. Imperative? Why is it so necessary? And what's so significant about this? Why doesn't, why, what's so significant is that the laws of the Torah that we have, you, not, can, you can't understand it. You do it because you're told to do. Does Hashem really desire us to be dummies? Really? Anybody think that Hashem wants us to be dummies? Just be a robot? For robots, he could have created robots. God, God was he's a very he's a masterful uh, builder. And let the robots put on fuel on their, on their uh, lifeless arms. They would do it perfectly. And the film will always be in the right place, centered. And no problem, everything is perfect.
nobody doubts, nobody ever, ever thinks that when it says chuko, you must be obedient, means that you, be, you have to put them over this moment, you have to be an idiot. Absolutely not. It does not mean that. When we, as a nation, together said, Naase v'nishma, not only were we not idiots, not only were we not robots, we were at the pinnacle of our intelligence. The highest level of intelligence we experienced at that moment. Good. Doesn't make sense, right? I, I was going to ask how. I didn't want to no, no, you don't have to ask. I, I, I know that everybody's asking how. Yeah. And I could read your face very clear, okay? And, but I'm good that you're asking how. That's at least, okay? Now we are kind of on the same wavelength. I want you to understand. At that moment, we were at the pinnacle of our intelligence. We had a mountain over our heads. I'm sorry? We had a mountain over our heads. <laughs> We have a mountain of red, that's also true. And the truth is that that mountain had, had elicited a much deeper insight, a much deeper realization than we would have, came, we would have come up with without it. There, there's a, there are a lot of explanations from the Sarah about it. But I want you to understand the Nasser and Nishma was a very profound statement. It was not a statement of oh, being, okay, yeah, don't throw the mountain down, I'll be a good boy. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. We saw the MS, though. I mean, ultimately, we saw, like, a shine. I mean, you know? I want to, uh, to explain not only as a historical factor, but I want to explain that this is true for each one of us at any given time and, every, and all the time. We all have the capacity to have that insight. Not only we have the capacity to have the insight, we must strive for it. The whole purpose of Torah learning is to remove all obstacles and all confusion and to reach into that pure depth of the soul to be able to and recognize this truth. Nasa Venetian was not just a momentary thing, so we got the Torah. That wasn't the point. That moment changed our whole personalities forever. Even though it changed our personality forever, we can all stumble and we can all fall back, but we can always rise up again. The truth has been established within us, has been imbued in us, has been engraved in us. We may forget it. You know, there's a story. I mentioned it to you, if I remember correctly. There's a story about where, where, when the Friedrich Rebbe established the yeshiva, they came to this country. So a couple of very choshev chesidim, elderly chesidim, made a trip to Chicago. In those days, to go to Chicago was much more difficult than today. Today, you get on the plane two hours later in Chicago. Then it was an overnight trip. It was a difficult trip. Anyway, the very Hoshua people, and I can mention the names, but you probably would know the difference. And they went to Chicago to raise funds for the issue. 
In Chicago, there were there were other chassidim already in the Babish chassidim. There, were, there was a chosse there. He greeted them. He welcomed them, and he took him around the city, introducing them to the various people in the city, um, whether they are uh, the wealthy people or the rabbonim, all kinds of different. They introduce you know they shouldn't just storm the city uh, incognito. So he took them to a certain person. Apparently he was also a man of means and he was also an intelligent man. And this man was very much involved in the Jewish affairs of the city of Chicago. He was not a, a stranger to Yiddishkeit, not a stranger to, to doing, to working for Yiddishkeit. So this man asked the Nabonim that came from New York, Rabbis, why did you come here? Don't we have Yiddishkeit in our city? And Chicago was a city, you know, Chicago is a heavy Jewish city. Rabbis, why did you come here? It wasn't an, a, it wasn't a, 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 a confrontational um, question, it was not a question of a, a rejectionist question, it was a, a a practical question that he wanted to make sense. Why did you come here? We don't have any rabbonim over here that you had to come. So, and they have Jews and so forth. So, I think that the, their host who introduced them answered to this screen and said, every yid has an ois in a sefer table. That's a letter in a sefer table. Every yid is a letter in Sefer Teira. The letters in Sefer Teira have to be guarded. They shouldn't become possible. It is possible that the letter in Sefer Teira should become scraped, scratched, scraped, and it can become possible. When the letter becomes possible, what do you do? You call a scribe, and he fixes that letter and makes it kosher again. These rabbis came to make all letters that became possible in Chicago to make them kosher. You understand the analogy, right? So this was, so to speak, a very triumphant answer to the point. And they felt very good about it. They came back to New York and the rabbi asked for a full report of what happened in Chicago. If we look it up. And they related what happened. When it came to this story, they proudly related this story and this question and this answer. When the Rebbe heard this answer, the Rebbe became very serious. Very pensive. And he said, a yid never becomes possible. Some dust can settle on it. And then you have to take a little brush and brush off the dust and it can, begins to shine again. A yid can never become possible. That which occurred at Matmuta, when we said, Nasser and Yishma. That established itself in the Jewish soul. And even though it seems that dust settled on it and we are not fully aware of who we are, that's only dust. The reality remained the same. And the job of the Rabbonim, the job of the Yeshiva, of anybody who is, so to speak, trying to help even to identify themselves, his job is to brush off the dust. Now please understand, when you brush off the dust, what happens? Are you creating a new letter? Which means that each one of us has to recognize what's going on in his own mind, in his own heart. You can't teach him. You can't give it to him. 
he has to have cognizance of what's going on in his mind. He has to be a living person, a sensitive person. You can help him uncover, you can help him come and come forth. Dust him off. But the real life force does not come from what we, what we give them. Life force comes from himself. Because he is a living ice, a living Jew. This is so important to recognize. You know, we sit and learn. And we're learning. We translate words. We put sentences together, and we make sense of the sentence. This is what he said, this is what he said, this is how it is, this is how it is. Like you said, <coughs> secularly, a robbery is more severe. Third of you, and, and thievery is more severe. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to you? No, 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 no. What does it mean to you? You again, you're giving me slogans. There has to be a living soul inside. What does it mean? Why? What is? What is the message of Torah? What is the Torah message? Why does the Torah? What? What does it mean that theory is is, is most of you? It. Shina Sam is very central. You see, again, you're giving me slogans. Personally, on your personal level, if you were, God forbid, a thief, or you're a robber. I'd want to be a robber. You'd rather be a robber. I don't want to be either. I don't If I had to be one or the other, I'd rather be a robber. Okay. More open, more bold, less cowardly. Dare I say better values, you know? Brave. But I'd rather starve. Than starve. Brave. Brave, yeah. Brave. Okay. You've been giving me a secular definition. You didn't give me a clear definition. Brazen, I said, brazen, no, brazen no, it's no, all no, the same no, thing. No. It's all the same thing. Um, Hashem commanded us. Okay, look, please understand. Okay, I, I, okay, we, we got it. <laughs> we got it, we got it. All of these things, and I said, the ice is there, and all you have to do is brush it off. And then that ice has to give off its own light, its own brightness, its own shama. That is the important thing. Coming back to our question. What is the meaning that Hashem said, we have to be obedient? Huko. Just, this is the law, accept the, 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 the decree, or we say, Nasa Venishma. Where is the Neshama? Please understand my question. Where is the Neshama? Where is the human being in those statements? To be able, I don't know, to be able to deal with it on an emotional level? Like, you don't know, fine. All I want is that we should understand the question at this point. Where is the human being? Is it, that the Rebbe still want us to cease to be human, cease to be sensitive, cease to be understanding and intelligent? <coughs> ah? I'm sorry? Go beyond yourself. Go beyond yourself, but you have to know what you're going behind. Why do you want to, why do you go beyond? Go beyond because somebody is, is throwing you beyond. What does it mean? It's raising, seven, us, huh? it's raising us up. How is it raising us up? Because uh, it's, it's, it's raising us up by making us robots mm. and insensitive. Yeah, where's the free will? Free how does it? How does it raise us up? Okay. Oh, we are perfect. Perfect specimens of what? When we said Nasa Venishma, now listen carefully. If you open up the Chumash, I think I mentioned it one time here. 
No problem the Chumash. The whole episode took place, is mentioned in the Torah twice, in Parshas Yisroi, and then in Parshas Mishpot. In Parshas Yisroi, this is where Matan Torah is described. It mentions two times that Eden said Nasa. Kurashi Dibra Hashem Nasa. Just Nasa, no Nishma, just Nasa. Two times. That wasn't good enough. Then in Pasha Mishpotim, Meshe Bot Karbonis, and the whole, a whole, a whole process, and then Eden said Nasa and Nishma. And when he said Nasa and Nishma, that was accepted, and then there was a, there was Martin Toy. What's wrong with Nasa by itself? If you want to be a robot, Nasa is a better robot than Nasa and Nishma. Nasa and Nishma says, I'll understand later. Nasa says, I don't need to understand. I'm just there, <laughs> just accepting what you tell me to do. Clearly, that wasn't Hashem's plan that we should become robots. Because he waited for Nasir and Nishma. Not only that, he waited for it. He even said, Nasir, he said, no good. Nasir, no good. What else? Until they reached deep down into their souls and said, Nasir and Nishma. Moshe Rabbeinu could have told them, here's what Hashem wants you to say. Say Nasir and Nishma. Finished. Never told them that. He waited for them to say it. About Karbanas, the whole process is looking past the spot in, you know, everything is brief, but, but uh, 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 clearly you see what it's talking about. Which is more obedient? Which Nasa. is more submissive? Nasa. Nasa or Nasa Venishma? Nasa. Nasa. Nasa is more submissive. If Hashem wants us to be submissive, so what's wrong? We said twice. What else do you want from us? To understand why we're being obedient. First show faith, and then through practice you'll learn why. Again, listen to me. We can learn from here till, till forever. The real learning. Did you have an experience of the following experience? I want to ask you this. You, you, you are learning something. Somebody is trying to explain something to you. And you can't make sense of it. You can't relate to it. You ask questions and use the answers and it goes back and forth. And it still doesn't, doesn't hit it. Then, after a long give and take, a long discussion, many generations, suddenly, oh, that's what you mean. Oh, of course, that's obvious. Did you ever experience that? Yeah. Of course, that's obvious. I always knew it. What do you mean you always knew it? It make, took me three hours to get you to see it. What is that about? think, you know... What is that about? Did you know it or you didn't know it? Are you lying now? You're not lying. You say, oh, yeah, of course it makes sense. So how come it didn't make sense three hours ago, or two hours ago, and an hour ago? It's true that you always knew it. But knowledge exists on many levels. Intelligence exists on many levels. Please understand this. It's very important. Our intelligence is not the result of us learning and being taught. Our intelligence is the result of who we are by birth of Anishomis, 
This is where intelligence comes from. Intelligence, human intelligence is the product of human nisham, of human life. You can sit and explain to a cat, not for three hours, but 300 years, and nothing, nothing is going to happen. Zero. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. You know the famous story with the Rambam? Everybody knows the story, right? You know the story, Gabriel? I don't know. You know the story, Gabriel? <laughs> oh, why? What you're what you missing? <laughs> All right, the story is the following. The Rambam, so who is a scholar in, 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 in the kings, in the, in the, in the, so to speak, in the, in the palace, and uh, he was very highly respected by the by the sultan and um, and as you can imagine he had many many detractors many uh, envious guys who tried to always so to speak detract from him unseat him put him down for many reasons one for one because he was head and shoulders upon them and none for another is he was a Jew so a Jew is always everybody's uh, enemy so the, the scholars, the court scholars, came to the king and they said, you know something? An animal is not much different than a human being. The difference is a human being that's, that's training and raises and so An animal, you let, let him run in the street. If you take an animal and train him, the animal will be able to act like a human being. And the sultan called the Rambam and says, my dear friend, what do you think about this? That's totally not true. Totally not true. There's no way that an animal will ever acquire human intelligence. No way. It doesn't exist. So the Sultan says, okay, here's my challenge to you. You guys prove your part, and you, Raman, prove your part. So he said, sure. So they took a cat and they started training the cat. What was the training of the cat? They trained the cat because they assumed that at the end of the whole procedure there was going to be a feast celebrating their victory. And um, at this feast, this cat is going to be the, ma the main waiter that's going to serve at the head table, right? That's, that's the, the elite of the waiters, right? Every waiter wants to be served at the head table. That's where you get the better tips. So the cat was trained, and indeed the cat, you know, of course, carried the, the plate in its mouth, whatever it is, but it really was trained uh, in physics very, very perfectly, and it was, it was, we are finished. They came to the sultan and said, we are ready. So he said, fine, they're ready. Schedule on this and this day is going to be the demonstration. And of course, at the demonstration, it's going to be a royal feast. Everybody is there. The whole royalty, the whole, you can imagine, everybody is there. And, and all of these people are sitting there. And um, all of a sudden, a cat walks out. Don't fall asleep now. The cat walks out and serves the royal plate and serves it beautifully and puts it down and gives a bow and moves back. What? Then it serves the prime minister, then it serves the next. Everything in perfect, in perfect order and in perfect uh, respect. It's a, okay. Everybody is wondering, he says, this is, this is phenomenal, this is fantastic. So the Sultan at that point turns to the Rambam and he says, my friend, Rabbi Moshe, what do you say? The Rambam says, it's really a phenomenal accomplishment. I beg permission to leave the feast for a few moments and I'll come back with my answer. 
Ramos goes out, whatever time it takes, he comes back, and the um, Sultan says, no, you have an answer, a refutation to that. Ramos says, I do. Ramos stands up, takes a box, a little box, out of his pocket. Hold the box on his hand. Opens the lid. Out jumps a mouse. As soon as the mouse jumps, our great elite waiter drops whatever he has and starts running after the mouse. In the meantime, he soils all the royal, the royal garments, and the whole thing is becomes becomes a turmoil. Turmoil. These garments, how are you ever going to clean these garments? These are golden, you know. Anyway, that was the Ramazan's. He didn't say anything? Didn't say anything. He spoke, the cat, the mouse spoke for him. <laughs> There's no way. No, the, the intelligence is exclusively a godly gift to the human being. And this gift was given to him not in isolation as intelligence. It was given to him by virtue of his neshama, of his soul. Please understand, this is a human quality. A human being who lacks intelligence, there's something wrong with him, something not right. Because a human being he has to have neshama. That's the definition of a human being. He has a neshama and he has intelligence. And in this neshama, in this intelligence, he perceives a different level of truth. A truth that is defined exclusively by his intelligence, not by, by experiment, not by physical, by, by, by physical process. A human being knows, say for instance, you know, appreciates. I once, yeah, I think over here also I gave a very simple analogy, very simple demonstration. You come to a chasana. You walk into the chasana hall. And right next to you walks in a cat. I wouldn't say a dog, a dog doesn't belong. A cat, a cat, everybody tells tell her it's a cat. Right? You walk into the house in the hall and the cat walks in with you. You both observe the, 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 the scene identically at the same moment. What do you see? What does the cat see? Please. Okay? Don't embarrass yourself. What do you see? Please answer, answer please to the point. You see people. What? You see people? What else do you see? You see food? What do you see? I see a class and I see people getting married. What do you see? You see something super worldly, human quality, joy. You can't even put a finger on it. I hope that's what you see. Anyway, this is what you're meant to see. This is what you're capable to see. Due to our analytical training, we may not see it right away because we are trained to always analyze, okay, what is this table doing over here? What is this table doing over here? Please, what do you say, in, so to speak, in a dynamic manner? Dancing, singing, enjoying. You see joy, yeah. not you people feel, dancing. You feel, you feel you, that's right. What does a cat see? I'm guessing just food. Food. And that's what a cat sees. threatening human audience. That's right. And the yeah. tables are only yeah. obstacles. Yeah. The cat figures the tables yeah. are yeah. obstacles. Yeah. How it's trying, how I get to the food. That's all it's capable of seeing. The human being sees the intangible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Joy, is joy tangible? 
describe to me joy. It's almost palpable. I don't know if I say No, no, it's almost palpable because you are a human being. You feel the vibe. Is it, is it a tangible presence? Is it a physical presence? It is not. The human being with his intelligence. That's what intelligence is all about. To see the intangible. To see the spiritual. To see the godly. To see the living, the soul element. That's what intelligence is about. That's what the human being is about. That's what the, what the human being is in the category by himself totally. The whole world is up and screaming, oh, there's smart animals, look at this. Don't be so chauvinistic, you. Smart animals. Yes, they are smart. The animals are very smart. They can outsmart other animals. And some human beings are even smarter than animals. Can you imagine that? But this is not what intelligence is about. Not what you can outsmart. And the animal is smart enough to find a way to get their food. That's not, that's not intelligence. That is not intelligence. What's it called, with due respect? What's it called for an animal? Cognition? No. It, 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 Learning? One second. Instinct. One, one, one second. One second. Again, definition of intelligence. Oh, it's not a shaman. That's, right. that's it. Okay. Please, remember that. Definition of intelligence is an shoma recognition, something that you cannot touch with your hand. Anything that you can touch with your hand and you figure out how to get to it, that's not intelligent. That's smarts. It was smart, smart. Okay, you try this way. doesn't work. You go this way until you find it. That's not intelligence. Intelligence is providing a different definition, different reality. The human being defines reality with his intelligence, not with his hands and feet or with his mouth. That does not exist in the animal world. This is a godly gift. The neshama that Hashem put into the human being is of a different caliber. No matter what animal you're comparing him, there's no comparison is ridiculous even to speak of. So we see this, and Toyota explains very simply in simple terms. The animal, the life force in the animal, the life force in the animal, animals live. The life force in the animal is limited to, to quicken, so to speak, enliven the body, to give life to the physical body. That's the life force in the animal. The life force in the human being is independent of the body. Yes, it is in the body. And you, 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 you think in the body, but what you are thinking about is something that the body itself cannot possibly understand or relate to. So what, what if a, a guy goes to a wedding and he... One second, we'll be a little bit more important about the guy. We, are, we, want, we want to understand over here, this is not, this is not academic course, this is... Uh, you know, subjective course, for us. You understand? We're looking to find ourselves. We're looking to find our way. We're looking to open up and to, and, and to begin to live. Intelligence is exclusively a human element and a soul element. The human soul is different than the life force of the animal. The life force of the animal is limited to a physical quickening, so to speak, that makes, life, that makes the body alive. The human being has, lives at two levels. His body is alive by physically breathing, by physically eating, and then he's got the intelligence, the chokhmah, he does not define his life on the basis of eating and drinking. He defines his life on the basis of what am I sensitive to? What's in reality? What is my life about? And what is the world about? 
Where does the world come from? What is the world here for? Why did God create the world? What does that have to do with your next lunch? Zero. It has nothing to do with it. And yet this is what preoccupies the human mind. And you give him all the lunches in the world. And he's miserable because he can't find himself. What am I, what's my life about? So, okay, obviously we still need to digest it and discuss it and so forth. I just want to conclude, the, you know, this Pasha, the sin of Hukkah. The name from Nasev and Nishma. As I said, Nasev and Nishma were at the moment the pinnacle of human intelligence. Because at that moment, we in total concert, the entire Jewish people recognized the godly truth. The intelligent, the, intel, the intangible truth, the godly truth. That's intelligence. The Rambam begins his safe, his book, with the following words, which are quoted many times. foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom is to know that there is a first being that brings everything forth and it is the truth of his presence that gives presence to everything else. Now this whole statement, because this is the beginning of wisdom, this whole statement has nothing to do with practical living. When you go and you buy a piece of bread, it's bread. To the human being, that's not one. That's not where life begins. Life begins to the, in the knowledge that there's a first being. And as a first being, then I can relate that there is also bread. And if there's not a first being, I can't relate to what there is bread. What's bread? This knowledge is inherent and it's exclusively a human insight. This is not something that can be proven. It's not based on proof. It's not based on logic. Because the Raman said this is the basis of all wisdom. That means that this precedes wisdom. It's not based on wisdom. It's not based on logic. Because this is the basis of wisdom. This we know before we even begin to think. This is the meaning of chukah. Chukah is a prayer. This is what Hashem accepted in giving us a Torah. A Torah is a godly wisdom, godly law in order for the human being to be able to relate to the godly law. The human being has to come and bring out, so to speak, the purest and the highest element of his wisdom. 
which consists essentially in one word. There is only one true reality. And it consists more than in a word. It's beyond a word. Which is something which is known before I know how to speak. Before all wisdom. This is why this is called chukah, because it's engraved in the soul. You don't have to learn about it. You have to, if you don't know, you have to shake off the dust. Sometimes you need a good shake for that dust to come off. Sometimes it's a shake that really shakes us up. But we need, we need to go through it, because we have to wake up to real life. And this is what that mountain on top of our heads did for us. So this is the, the principle of Chuko, this is the principle of Torah, this is the principle of Yiddishka, this is the principle of human intelligence, despite the fact that we enjoy a joke and sometimes out of place. But nevertheless, I hope we didn't miss the whole message. As I said, we here have to be able to account for uh, to ourselves, not to anybody else, to ourselves. If we haven't a, a bit of intelligence, we understand what stage of life we're in here and, where we, and what life is about, we have to be able to account for every day. If I have to dust, so to speak, dust off my, my intelligence, it could be a thick layer of dust. Okay, how much dust did I dust off today? Did I sense anything? Did anything come through? So that I can come out and start experiencing life, experiencing the world the way Torah sees it. And my this much closer to realizing the godly truth that is not in intellectual dependent, is not logical dependent, it's just a truth that allows for everything else to be. This much closer, even for one moment. You know, I once explain the following analogy. Sight is probably the most important of all our senses. All our senses are meant and function and they serve to make us aware of the world around us. Whether it's touch, whether it's smell, whether it's taste, that's what that fine senses are about. Then there is sight. And sight is in a category all by itself, in terms of our senses, or what it makes us aware, how it allows us to relate to the world around us. And the difference, in brief, all our other senses, we're experiencing everything, like when you touch the table, experience it, how it affects me. I feel it's cold, it's hard, it's, it's, it's smooth, whatever it is, it, I know it through personal experience. It's not knowing the truth of the table by itself, it's knowing how it affects me. That's all the other sense of smell, taste, and so forth. Sight is what gives us a sense of the reality of the world. Because I know it without being affected by it, I don't have to come in contact with it. Just know it's there. It's, no, it's true, it's reality. 
Sight is thus the most important of all our senses. It brings the world to reality to us. Somebody who has got to be sightless really doesn't have a real world. To him the world is not real, it's imaginary. It's not real, there's halachim involved in this and so forth. Now, what is the story of the person who had sight at one time and God forbid he lost the sight? What's his status? Is the world real to him or not? It's closed off. Why should it be closed off? Is the world real to him or not? The answer is yes, because at one time he experienced sight. And that remains ingrained in his mind. He had experienced sight. This which we are talking about, to have this insight, even if you have that insight for one moment, it changes your personality forever because you've seen the reality. Even if afterwards you have to start all over again. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, what if Son were born that I'm saying if he's born that way, like he doesn't have a real world. Somebody who's born sightless, God forbid. The Allah is he's spotted for all the mitzvahs. He being spotted on mitzvah because he has no Yitzhar Hora. Yitzhar Hora, as, as, as bad as he is, but he's not stupid. He only wants something real. If it's not real, he doesn't want it. But he has his own reality. I'm not trying to argue now. That's not real. No, you can be argumental. Come on, uh, 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 Rebbe. Please f follow the point that we're trying to get to. Okay? It's not real. That's not, you know, reality means that you're drawn to it even if it's not if you don't have it, if you taste something and you've tasted it, you taste it. The Allah is that Shabbos is supposed to have candles on the table. Why? Oh. Originally, uh, why are you supposed to have candles on the table? What's your original reason for the candle? Uh, you don't know. Huh? I'm sorry? What's, what's, what's the point? Because you have to have light so that you can enjoy your food because of food that is tasty. But you don't see it, you can't enjoy it. Because it's not real. You're coming in into a new world, my dear friend. Okay? You must make all the effort to understand what I'm explaining to you. I mean, not understand, but to open up to it and relate to it. And find it in your mind. Until you will say, Why, Rabbi? You know, I always knew this. I really always knew it. I was never aware of it. Believe me, you always knew it. But you never became aware of it. And you're still not fully aware of it. With God's help, you'll become aware of it. So, again, just want to reiterate, keep in mind, time is of the essence. Time is very limited. Every day has to be accounted for. And the primary thing is to dust off a little bit more of the covering of your intelligence. Just a little more so that it begins to become brighter and clearer and truer and closer to the truth. Okay. Majhat Slocha. Hmm?